Welcome to the final film in a three-part series where Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to Professor Carmen Scheibenbogen from the University Hospital Charité in Berlin. She's a long-recognised expert in the field of MECFS and has recently been researching pathophysiology and treatments for long COVID. In this film, we talk about how long it might be before we can expect to see effective treatments getting through phase two and phase three trials, and why it is that getting this research done takes so long. Hope you find it helpful. One disadvantage is probably of these trials that in many of the patients who are included in these trials are not very well defined. So we find trials in which just long COVID patients are included. And I think this is um, probably not wise because um, I think um, um, we have then patients with different mechanisms and probably only a few um, are those who can respond to the therapy and then these treatments are probably negative and um, we won't learn much. So I, our approach is that we define patients as good as possible clinically. Um, so we treat subgroups of patients, for example, the order anybody approach, we currently only treat patients with MECFS, um, the immunosuppressive um, um, corticosteroids, we only give patients um, who have severe neurocognitive impairment because we know that in many of these patients, we do have neuroinflammation or neurological autoantibodies. And um, of course, we also have these um, comprehensive biomarker analysis, which I think is crucial um, at this early stage of clinical development to learn the most as possible from clinical trials. I mean, I, I think one of the challenges which you point out there so successfully is when you've got a condition that's this heterogeneous with multiple different mechanisms, multiple different symptom clusters, we don't yet seem to have out there a, um, a convention about how we do those groupings. It, it seems like every, every sort of, as you say, people doing the trials, they're just throwing all long inverted commas, long COVID patients together into the trial. But within those patients, there will be several different types of patho mechanisms and clusters of symptoms, and they'll respond differently to treatments. But it's, I just wish there was some more widely accepted um, groupings so far out there, where actually, you know, everybody working in the space and researching in the space would agree and say, okay, <laughs> this is one group of long COVID patients, this is another group of long COVID patients, and these are the people with these symptoms. I mean, what do you think it's going to take for us to get there? And, and is that something that you have seen too yourself in terms of this different perspectives on what might be going on and then different groupings or no groupings? Yeah, well, we can already group some patients. For example, if we use these MECFS criteria, we can group those fulfilling the Canadian criteria. Then we have a larger group fulfilling the IOM criteria. We have patients who have orthostatic intolerance. Um, we have a diagnostic criteria there for POTS. We have diagnostic criteria for orthostatic hypotension. Um, we have diagnostic criteria for certain neurocognitive um, um, impairments uh, based on biomarkers. For example, we have antibodies in the, um, in the um, cerebrospinal fluid and so on. But for other patients, we, for example, have these patients with muscle pain and fever, and they do not fit in any diagnostic um, um, criterion at the moment. But what we then should do we should at least use um, similar criteria to assess these symptoms. For example, fatigue. There are so many different um, questionnaires to assess fatigue. And we should also um, use um, objective measures. For example, if you, if you have a patient with fatigue, many of these patients do also have a muscle fatigue, which you can measure quite easily by hand grip strength. All these orosthetic problems, you can measure nicely by um, this um, nasaline test. Um, so um, I think these are crucial parameters which should be assessed in every patient, although you not intend to treat POTS. But this is a comorbidity which is present in many patients and probably physicians are, are not aware at all that they should look at this as well. Um, so this is something we try to establish, at least in Germany, which is difficult, of course, too, because you cannot um, tell um, the physicians what they have to do. You can only make suggestions. But um, I think this would 
be a way um, how we can much better compare what we do in different trials and would be probably the fastest way to learn more. I think the frustrating thing is you seem to be one of the only teams who are doing this. <laughs> this isn't being done everywhere else as well. Um, it's hard. Anyway, Asad, I'll let you pick up. Do you have, I know it's probably a difficult question to answer, but an idea of sort of timelines where patients might expect some of the treatments that you're trialing to become available in, uh, for wider clinical use? For me, it's it's uh, much too um, slow. Um, the problem we have nowadays is that we have a lot of bureaucracy um, to initiate clinical trials. So um, in Europe, it's minimum a year um, from the day you decide that you want to initiate this clinical trial until you can um, include the first patient. And I think it's a little bit easier in the US still. Um, if you would have had the pandemic 20 years before, it would have been much easier. I think we would have much more clinical trials running already. Um, and the problem is also because of all these bureaucracy, um, um, it's much more expensive nowadays to do clinical trials. And the um, companies are very hesitating. So um, I have been talking to many pharmaceutical companies until now, there are very few who are really interested in doing clinical trials, at least in Germany, and especially the larger companies. We need to pay the drugs by ourselves, and we also um, need to prepare all the documents you need to file for do a clinical trial. And um, that is more complicated if you are not um, the company developed the drug and um, so nevertheless, I think um, as uh, trials are running now worldwide and um, we have one big advantage, is, that is we have many patients. So we have no problem in recruiting these trials rapidly if we have at least infrastructure to do the clinical trial. End of this year, we will probably have already results from the first trials. And um, if um, we have candidates which are effective, I think then there is a high um, pressure from patients that these are rapidly tested in so-called phase three trials and, and get um, licensed for therapy. So I hope that within one to two years, we will um, have first trials. Actually, there was already one positive trial uh, with AXA, um, one, one, two, five. Right. That is, of course, not um, a game changer. It's just some amino acid. But it's positive and this will probably be followed by um, phase three trial and, and will get licensed. And this is just showing that if, if pharmaceutical companies um, support the trials, it, it can probably go uh, faster than if we do it all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd just like to say on behalf of everybody out there who's suffering with either MECFS or long COVID, a huge thank you for all of the work that you have done and are continuing to do and for being a standard bearer for, you know, driving our knowledge of the condition forwards and trying to help patients because it's so, so important for the millions. <laughs> it is millions with long COVID who are suffering. So, yeah, from each and every one of us, I would just like to say a huge thank you. And I'd like to add my personal thanks to that as well. Uh, you've been a great help to me. Of course. I think that's our responsibility as physicians. I'm in charge of patients with ME, CFS and COVID. And I have the opportunity that I can do both, treat patients and do research, which is the opportunity you have only when you work at the university. So, And I think there are many, many um, who um, share my attitude. And therefore, I'm quite hopeful that um, uh, we will... Um, find treatment in the near future and that gives me also much hope for all these MECFS sufferers we had already before the pandemic who have been um, sick for for decades yeah, it, sh it shouldn't have taken the pandemic should it because yeah. we could have been so much further along in our understanding had the proper research been funded yeah I want to add what one, one um, thing which is important I think um Although we have no drugs um, which can cure um, MECFS, we um, have learned already that many with post-COVID um, get better over time. 
So not every um, post-COVID uh, patient is chronic. We know that early in the disease, um, many patients improve or heal within the first months. And then we have a subgroup uh, with persistent disease after six, after 12 months. But even in these patients, we still see that many of them get better over time. But on the other hand, um, the most um, severely affected are probably those who have MECFS. For these, um, we do have some um, symptomatic treatments which are quite effective and which are available already. And there, at least in Germany, the problem is that many physicians are not familiar with these type of treatments. So we can help um, a lot, for example, with um, sleep problems, with um, uh, autostatic intolerance. There are several um, drugs um, which um, are licensed, which uh, are quite effective and in a subgroup, drugs like Mestinone, for example, or Ivabradin, um, just to mention a few, or certain drugs which help in the allergic symptoms, antihistamines, which can also improve the orthostatic problems and so on. It's a lot of, of trial, of course, and not every um, drug helps everybody. And then we have already um, off-label um, drugs, which are quite cheap and, and can be um, used in very low doses, like um, low-dose um, Abilify or low-dose Naltrexone, which again can be very helpful for some patients. So I think... Um, it's important that we use the things we have already now. And there, my understanding is that many patients don't get any um, support from their physicians because um, these physicians are just not familiar with these diseases. And we just had an international meeting um, in which uh, we also had some presentations on drugs and that is available online. So you can um, listen to um, um, these uh, talks um on the site of the Charité Fatigue Center, um, which gives you some information about uh, potential uh, drugs which are already available. We just published a paper um, in um, the German Journal for Physicians, which also um, summarizes the most important um, concepts, how to diagnose and treat MECFS, which could be easily translated, but um, there are also good advices from US groups, uh, for example, from the US MECFS coalition, on, on drug therapies. And that is something, um, if your physician doesn't know about these therapies, then probably you as a patient should um, print this article and, and give it to your physician. And you should always uh, come with a concept already. So tell your physician, I have severe sleep problem and I want you to help me with my sleep problem. So that is something every physician is familiar with. And by this, it's probably possible uh, to get um, the physicians also to um, to treat uh, specific symptoms. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, there is so much uh, around that can be used to improve symptoms. Uh, but the problem is not just in Germany, it's everywhere, where A, a lack of familiarity, but B, something I call guideline paralysis. So mm -hmm. if it's not in a guideline, and if there hasn't been a randomized controlled trial, then suddenly we our hands are tied and we can't do anything. And that is just not good enough. Anyway, yeah. rant over. But uh, treatment of pain and, and sleep disturbance and autostatic problems, there is licensed therapy. So if you don't um, ask, please treat my MECFS or post-COVID, but please treat my symptom, I think um, then you make it much easier for your physician to help you. I mean, that's the advice in the long COVID handbook that uh, with Danny and I uh, that we give as well is to uh, go to your doctor with a plan and to talk about specific symptom sets which they are more familiar with rather than yeah. the condition as a whole which they're not. Thanks for watching this series of films. If you've missed one of the first two parts, then the links are in the description. One final quick addendum. If you weren't aware, I've started a second channel on YouTube. And rather than talk about long COVID, instead in this one, I lean on my almost 20 years of experience in the production industry to break down why certain successful or particularly interesting films and TV shows are as good as they are. So if you're interested in seeing the nuts and bolts that make these emotion machines tick 
sorry, some mixed metaphors there. But if that sounds like your thing, please do go and check them out. This link is for Top Gun Maverick and why it's even better than the original. And I've also broken down Succession as well. Links are also in the description. Coming up will be Last of Us and, and then some other stuff I need to think about. So if you've got any suggestions, stick them in the comments. Look after yourselves. Until next time.